Thank you so much for coming this evening to talk and to hear about abundant access. My name is Jennifer Keithmat and I'm the Chief Planner here at the City of Toronto. And this evening's event is a part of the conversation that we've been undertaking calling, uh, we've been called Feeling Congested, Toronto Talks Transportation. And you might think that's sort of a negative way to start a conversation off about transportation planning, but in fact, we wanted to recognize the reality and the challenge that we experience in this city, whether it's related to walking, cycling, moving on transit, or moving in our cars. And I'm very excited to be welcoming today to be with us, Jarrett Walker. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce Jarrett Walker to you. Our program for this evening is going to fall, involve a brief introduction, then a presentation by Jarrett, and then a moderated discussion. And you may have noticed that uh, at the back of the room, there are some tags. You can, uh, if you don't have one, you'd like them to keep your hand up in the air. And these are tags for you to write your question on. And in the course of the presentation, if there's a question that emerges, pops into your mind, you can write it on one of these tags. At the end of the presentation, we'll be asking you just to hold them up in the air. Uh, Daniel or David will come around and grab them from you and bring them over to me and I'll take a look at them to use them uh, in order to shape the conversation that we're going to have about transportation and transit in this city. I thought I would begin by telling you a little story. And it's a very personal story because it's a story about my grandmother who is 93 years old. And I'm very lucky because my grandmother, for almost all of her 90 years, wrote down in great detail her life story. So when she was 85 years old, she decided to pull all of this detail together in a book and to hand this book over to my sisters and my cousins and my nieces and nephews as her life story. So eight years ago, I got this book and I sat down and I read it from cover to cover and it was fascinating to see my life in print. And a couple of weeks ago, I pulled out the book again and decided to take a look at it again. And I had a fascinating realization because this time I wasn't reading my life story. I guess I was reading it a bit more as an urban planner. And you see, my grandmother immigrated to Canada when she was a young adult with her husband, my grandfather. So the first quarter of the book is set in Holland. And the second part of the book is set in Canada. And in reading the story again, over the course of the past several weeks and days, I noticed something fascinating, and it's this. In the Holland story, the Netherlands story, every page is imbued at some point or another with a measurement, a distance from one place to the next, talking about a neighbor or where the church was located or going to visit another town. And the story of moving from one place to the, to the next was always measured in a bike ride. It was 20 minutes to church, of course by bike. It was a five minute bike ride to school. It was a 30 minute bike ride to visit her grandparents in a neighboring town. On a Sunday afternoon, she would go out for a two hour bike ride with her father and they would go to all these different parks and meadows and interesting places. Well, when she came to Canada, the story changed, of course. Everything was measured in rides. My grandfather worked 26 kilometers from their house. Each time she moved, she measured the distance to their friends and their families in how long it took to drive. Now what's fascinating to me about this story is that my grandmother's not, of course, a cycling advocate, although in her later years, every time she went to Holland, she of course got right back on her bike. And for many years on my desk at work, I had a picture of her on her, on her bike, and I think she was in her mid-80s when the picture was taken of her cycling along. And she's also not, she would never identify herself as a motorist. The way my grandmother choose to, chose to move around was a result of the infrastructure in front of her. The infrastructure in front of her gave her certain choices. And not really very consciously, she just simply chose to use the options and the infrastructure in front of her as a way to move around. In the context of talking about congestion and transportation planning in the city of Toronto, we have a profound opportunity to think about how we provide 
choice in our transportation planning and in our transportation systems. And abundant access, our conversation tonight, is about just that. It's about unleashing a fundamental part of the choice that exists in our transportation planning in the city of Toronto. Now, we of course used to be a leader in transit investment. And in fact, we've just gone through a rather unfortunate period of maybe 30 years or so, um, which is really about a generation of underinvesting in our transit infrastructure. And now we are in this catch-22 because we're way behind. We're 33 years behind. And we're trying to pick up the ball. And we are fighting about resources, about how to move forward and how to invest in infrastructure that we know we desperately need. This has proven to be a very tricky conversation. Let's not fool ourselves. And since we've launched Feeling Congested a year ago, it hasn't gotten any easier. In fact, it's often felt like it's become more complicated. And one of the opportunities that I believe our guest speaker presents to us tonight is some new thinking, some new language, some new ways of embracing this conversation around investing in transit and building transit infrastructure that is going to result in more choice and more freedom in the city of Toronto. Feeling congested is about how we move in this city, and it's about unlocking one of the most fundamental problems that shapes our everyday life, and that is how we move from place to place. You've probably heard the statistics about the amount of time we spend commuting in the greater Toronto area. It's astounding, really. It's equivalent of a, a work day a week that we spend on average commuting. And that doesn't just mean in our cars, whether it's on transit or in our cars. And part of improving our quality of life and ensuring the economic stability of our region in the future is linked to unlocking this key question around how it is that we are going to use our very important public dollars to increase choice and to increase access for as many people as possible. Now, we have a planning framework at the City of Toronto. It's called our official plan. Some of you may be familiar with this document. Throw your hand in the air if you've seen this document or read it. This is a very informed crowd that we have here this evening. <laughs> this document sets the vision and the framework for how it is that we expect to grow in the future. And with respect to movement in particular, this framework focuses in really four key areas. A focus on moving people, which is very different from using our infrastructure to primarily move cars. A focus on moving people, moving goods, recognizing that good mo goods movement is a fundamental part of our economy, but also moving less. Recognizing that when we integrate our land use planning with our transit planning, and we create mixed use communities that provide a variety of options, for getting from place to place and doing a variety of things within walking distance or a short transit ride from home, that we in fact have the option of moving less in our day-to-day -day life. All of this is contingent on moving minds. It's about recognizing that how we move and how we invest in infrastructure creates a, creates a culture that determines whether or not we will have that high quality of life. So we already have a vision in our transportation plan Part of what we're doing in the context of feeling congested is an evaluation of our policies that relate to transportation planning. And this is a very important exercise because those policies become regulation. Those policies, we will make recommendations to city council, council will, they'll like it, they might amend it, it'll get approved at the Ontario Municipal Board, and those policies will then be the regulatory framework for how we move forward. So far, currently, this is a pretty high level document. What we're seeking to do in the context of this official plan review is to add more detail, more certainty with respect to what Torontonians can expect with respect to movement and investment options moving forward in the future. Now in this process, we've asked a really important question and it's this, what kind of a city do we want? Because movement and where we invest in movement is about the kind of city that we're seeking to create. So we've identified a series of criteria. We've been working in a variety of communities across the city talking about these criteria. 
and we've created very detailed measures associated with each criteria. And we've really divided it up into three big categories, that transportation planning is about people, it's about creating places, and it's about ensuring long-term prosperity. In the context of those three large banners, we've identified a series of measures so that we can evaluate options when they come forward and evaluate how much they lead us to creating great places, how much they provide for people, and how much they reinforce prosperity in the city of Toronto. Now this materializes itself in a few different things. We have 24 rapid transit projects that we've been asked to evaluate by City Council. So these are a variety of projects that have come forward either through Metrolinks or they've come forward through, through a council motion and we've been asked to evaluate and prioritize these projects in relation to an overall larger network framework. And we're using those criteria, those measures, asking questions about, well, how does this specific project affect creating uh, a, a prior, prior, address priority neighborhoods and the need to provide access, transportation access, to priority neighborhoods? How do these various projects affect economic sustainability, meaning how do they link up with our employment plans? And we created detailed criteria around each, detailed measures around each of those criteria. We're also looking at the existing and planned Go Rail <coughs> network. And you can see here uh, a variety of proposals with respect to the GO Transit network. And we recognize that we need to link together regional planning with local planning. But we're also looking at bus and streetcar priority routes. Some of you have probably seen a map that shows our subway system and then it compares our subway system to, oh, I don't know, Paris or even New York, showing that our subway system is wholly inadequate. Well, in fact, it's a little bit unfair because we have a very sophisticated, although incomplete, bus and streetcar system that links into that subway system. And part of the next evolution of feeling congested is thinking really carefully about how the entire network works together and how we can, in fact, make investments in transit that increase access throughout the entire city. So this is what we're seeking to do in the context of feeling congested. As a way of shaping and informing the conversations that we're having, this evening is a moment to pause to hear a little bit about some of the conversation that's been going on in the city from an outside expert, from an outside perspective. And my hope is that in doing so, this will raise questions, raise meaningful and important questions that we need to be asking about how we move forward with a transit-oriented city in the city of Toronto. So on that note, it is in fact my great honor to be welcoming up to the stage Jarrett Walker. Jarrett is an international consultant in public transit, network design, as well as policy. And he has led major projects all over the world, including in, uh, in the States, in Australia, and in New Zealand. He has his own consultancy firm, which is based in Portland, Oregon. And he is the author of a book called Human Transit. And this is, in fact, how I stumbled upon Jarrett. I stumbled upon his website, probably through Twitter, some Twitter link. And then I stumbled upon his website, and I instantly ordered his book and picked it up. And what impressed me so much about the work that Jarrett has under, undertaken is that he links together very clearly this key question around what kind of a city is that we're seeking to create, and how can transit facilitate creating the kind of city that leads to abundant access and as, acts as an instrument of freedom. So please join me in welcoming Jared to the stage. Thank you. Something called abundant access. And um, what is this thing? No, um, this, um, this talk was marketed under a couple of different, is this live? Am I coming in? You're good enough. Abundant Access, uh, Public Transit and Instrument of Freedom, which is the title of, I suspect, my next book. <laughs> I, keep, I keep putting this title out so that people will ask me, so how's that book going? 
And uh, if enough people ask me that, I will probably sit down and write it. Um, but it was also marketed as uh, uh, something to the effect of um, how can transit facilitate prosperity? And in fact, I will be talking about both of those things in every breath all through our talk. So briefly about transit and prosperity, the, um, <laughs> I think we understand that there is a certain kind of city and a kind of city that is going to be increasingly desirable that fundamentally does not function without transit. And that transit is part of, of the essential infrastructure, the essential life of the city. One of the things that's always so silly about regional or province-wide conversations about transit is this notion that there ought to be a regional or province-wide concept of what kind of transit people should have. When in fact, transit responds so dramatically to density, transit's role is so different based on density that there is no such thing as a single answer about transit across all of Ontario or even across all of the GTA or even across all of the city of Toronto. So one of the ideas I want to place is that the relationship between transit and prosperity is different in different parts of the city based on the nature of the land use pattern and that any sort of city-wide policy is going to have to start by acknowledging that difference and encouraging us to be aware of that. <clears throat> Some of you may, may know who follow my blog or my Twitter feed that I um, uh, responded to a, 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 a remarkable piece in the Globe and Mail by Ryan Crowley a couple of weeks ago, which proposed that transit is really not a very important investment because it's not reducing congestion, and went on to show that, and, and cited, for example, my hometown, Portland, Oregon, and also cited Vancouver in Canada as examples of cities that have dreadful, dreadful congestion, and that flies that this is presumably because they have built transit rather than building roads. Of course, the whole reason that Vancouver and Portland have built transit instead of building roads is those, so that you have an alternative to that congestion. And so it was remarkable. I mean, what I pointed out about the Globe piece is that the Globe would publish in the business section as an article, an article that implies that congestion is the same thing as urban freedom. And to, to say that congestion is the same thing as urban freedom is to say that all non-voters do not exist and do not count as citizens. They're vaguely aware that you exist, but fundamentally the point is you do not count in our metrics. We do not care how the transportation system enables or impedes your sense of freedom. Does transit reduce congestion? Sometimes it does. I hear, this, I hear uh, claims that it does, and I don't exactly want to contradict them. But in the longer run, it's much safer to say that what transit is in the business of doing is protecting prosperity from congestion. And that is what it has done so brilliantly in Vancouver and Portland and other cities that I'm proud to have been a part of. Um, Vancouver, a city with no freeways. Um, a city with, yes, quite severe congestion, but also with excellent transit that makes it easy to get around the city without um, uh, without really experiencing all that much of that congestion. And that's ultimately the point. And the real estate values tell us how, how much people want that. And the real estate values don't want. So um, low congestion cities, by and large, are cities with poor economies. They're cities with not much going on. The only other way you get low congestion is through some sort of pricing of the access of the roads. Um, and I think we all know that deep down, but that is the only way you will actually eliminate or, or create an alternative to congestion on a highway like the 401. We know how values are changing, that driving is becoming much less popular, and I'm pulling together several different threads about this that I'm noticing, not just the common ones, that the age of the first driver's license continues to rise. That's an important stat to look at because I think a lot of middle-aged and older folks like myself have this attitude of, yeah, my kid, the millennial, he's 20 years old, he loves living in downtown Toronto, but he's single, and you know, once he gets a family and all that, he's gonna wanna move out to the suburbs and be on the cul-de-sac just like me. Well, maybe not. I'm always telling young people, please remember that the only way that history has ever progressed at all is that people have been turned out to be different from their parents. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and that maybe your kids are not exactly, uh, uh, are not going to be like you at your age. 
Another thing I always like to point out when we rely so heavily on predictions of ridership, predictions of demand 20 years into the future, which is a, a big part of some of the more cultish aspects of our transportation plan, that the whole premise of a 20 year or 30 year projection about demand is that when you are the same age that your parents are now, you will behave exactly the way they do. Right? That's the foundation <laughs> of all of our transportation modeling, is that you are all exact copies of your parents and your children will be exact copies of you who will make the same choices in the same situation. So in other words, there's room for quite a good air of skepticism over a lot of the traditional ways that we think about this. I'm very interested in the fact that young people seem to want continuous connection and that they're also more likely to be aware of the dangers of distracted driving. My partner's life was very profoundly influenced by a car accident at one time that disabled his mother. And as a result, um, I'm very, we're very aware every time we get into the car that we are about to do something just massively dangerous. And we really don't like that yet. We just don't like it. We don't like having that many lives in our hands when we're just trying to get to the grocery store. And I think other people are going to figure that out as we get more and more information about distracted driving, about the fact that as you pull together all this information about all the different ways that people can get distracted and kill other people with cars, it really comes down to the point that really safe driving is really, really boring. <laughs> you really do have to just stare at that asshole if you're not gonna kill someone. And that's boring, it's just not something that, 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 that busy human beings want to do. So, um, you know, I think it's amazing that our roads are as safe as they are, given what fallible creatures we are. And then, of course, there's the attraction to multimodal cities, the proximity, the freedom of access, the opportunity, the serendipity. There's also the fact that the ability to, live, this is not just about millennials, this is also about anyone who is any, anything less than wealthy, is that losing a car can be a key to affordability and can be a key to financial and economic advancement because owning a car is so massively expensive. We know that transit's essential for urban prosperity, but the market's telling us to build more of those places. And I want to emphasize that although downtown seems to us to be the supreme urban place where transit pays off to the greatest degree, there are many others existing or emerging all over Toronto, all over the GTA. And so it's important to be clear when we're talking about urban spaces that I'm not just talking about downtown Toronto, I'm talking about things that are emerging and can emerge all over the region. You, you fly into Toronto and you're struck by the clumps of towers all over the place. And those are the anchors, the focal points on which you can build a strong transit system over most of the region. But what is good transit? What's transit's task? What are we trying to do? This turns out to be a hard question. So I, I, I um, having spent a lot of time listening to people trying to talk about this and asking people about it, I thought of a different approach. Let's start with something easier. What's the essential task of the police? Well, the police build confidence in the city as a, as a place to invest and a place to live. The police participate in community programs. They fundraise for good causes and things like that. You would think the Nazis do that. Um, the police provide dramatic content to a film, <laughs> television, and video. There's a large economy of that that would not be possible without the law enforcement industry. And if you're a certain kind of 10-year-old boy, you'd say that the sirens make the city sound more exciting. And yet we all know somehow that that doesn't really get to why we have police. That police have an essential task that we call law enforcement, which is what they're really out there to do, and that all the other things they do are kind of ancillary to that. But now, what's the essential task of transit? Not long ago, I was at a, a bit of a soiree with a number of uh, leading um, urbanists and academics and thinkers in Vancouver, and I just asked them this question. On analogy to the idea that the essential task of police is law enforcement, on analogy to that, what is the essential task of transit? What are we trying, what do you think we're trying to do in the transit system? And I heard, well, the outline I just gave you, protecting the economy from congestion, they tend to say things like economic growth, um, social justice, social inclusion, meeting the needs of the disadvantaged, environmental outcomes, vehicle trip reduction, and so on, support for sustainable urban form. And I said, okay, yeah, those are all outcomes of us doing what we do, but what do we do? 
What's our essential task? What's the one goal that you want us to focus on that leads to all these goodies? Because what's happened, why transit politics is so difficult is that people don't realize that they agree with each other. <laughs> people don't realize that they want the same things because they're in their own silos describing what they want in different languages that are not mutually understood. So the person, the, the urban design and architecture guru who wants to support sustainable urban form doesn't actually understand that he wants the same thing as the person who's concerned about, uh, about the environmental outcomes, the DKT reduction. Doesn't understand, by the way, that he also wants the same thing as the hard-nosed fiscal conservative who just wants to spend less per customer on transit. They actually want the same thing. And so how do I start to describe an, an, an inspiring and motivating purpose for transit that encompasses all these things and captures the fact that they're all really the same thing? And that's, so what's the core task? And that's why I coined the term abundant access. Abundant access, the particular role of transit is abundant access without personal vehicles over distances too far to walk. And if you look at this Venn diagram, I would argue that if we clarify and pursue the goal of abundant access, we'll find ourselves success successfully meeting all of these different silos' needs, with the exception, to some extent, of the meeting of, 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 of the needs for social inclusion when we're talking about people who live in very expensive to serve places. That remains, I think, the toughest nut to crack. But by and large, an abundant access agenda is the agenda that does all of those other things. So what is abundant access? Okay, what do these people have in common? Well, first of all, they all seem to be happy. Uh, some of them are expressing freedom of speech. Several of them are customers and are expressing the freedom of the customer. Several of them are expressing freedom of association. They're hanging out with people that they want to hang out with. And how did they secure those basic freedoms? This is not a lecture in constitutional history or why you should admire various 19th century veterans. They secured those freedoms by arriving. And they arrived when they wanted to at their choice of destination. In other words, abundant access means as many people as possible able to reach as many destinations as possible as quickly as possible so that they have as many real choices and opportunities as possible and are therefore free. So one of the things I think we have to look at is that, is that if, we, if we can focus on this kind of collective freedom, we're now talking about something that gets a lot of people in the gut and really matters to people in democracies. And we're also talking about something that is so much bigger than transportation, and yet it turns out to imply a particular kind of approach to transportation and a particular set of priorities. Abundant access is multimodal, and here's an important thing. Transit isn't the right way to provide every kind of abundance. This is why, if you live in the inner city and you may use transit much of the time, now and then you'll, you'll many times you'll just walk, many times you'll ride a bicycle, a few times you'll, you'll, you'll use a taxi, you may use a car share. Those are all part of your abundance. But the fundamental uh, opportunity to live in a place with little or low rel no reliance on cars usually has transit in a central role. But this is also why there can be no Ontario provincial transit policy that, that gives everyone in the province the feeling of entitlement to a certain amount of transit, because rural Ontario in the upper right just does not need or reward the kind of transit that cities reward. There is an entirely appropriate role for cars and trucks and, and those kinds of tools in the business of rural, and, uh, of rural transportation. So, all of these things are part of abundance, but from now on I'm gonna talk for the rest of the lecture specifically about how we get abundance out of transit, because it seems to be a particularly difficult thing. Um, so, in my hometown of Portland, Oregon, um, you can, there's, uh, this is actually a beta, uh, it's not really a, 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 a clean version of a tool, and several agent companies are working on tools like this, but I wanna throw out this image for you. What if we could see our own transit access? What if, I could, what if every transit agency could show you a map of your freedom? So here, you can plunk down that pointer at a particular point, in this case, downtown Portland, and this tool tool will show you isochrones of where you, um, those blobs which show you where you can get to 
in on transit plus walking in 13 in, in 15 sorry 30 15 30 or 45 minutes those are the concentric blocks going out and when you draw it that way it's actually a map of transportation outcomes but we don't have to, to describe this by some desiccated technical term like travel time right when we turn travel time inside out it's a map of freedom it's a map of opportunity you can look at those blobs and see what's in them and see that yes your romantic partner and your job and your house of worship and your most important friends and the and the elderly mother you visit once every weekend are all inside a certain blob which means you don't have to worry transit is there for you to do all of those things and this is a very important tool for example to help people take responsibility for their location choices because, as we all know, in liberal democracies, freedom and personal responsibility are two sides of the same coin. People get to make free choices, and then they get to take responsibility for those choices, rather than just expect the government to protect them from them. So one of the basic things you can do is you can move your pointer around the map, and it will show you the consequences of locating your home or business in downtown Portland, or locating it out in a mid-city neighborhood, possibly analogous to North York, as opposed to locating it in a leafy garden suburb that doesn't support much transit and therefore it doesn't have much transit access. Once you see those alternatives, locate wherever you want. Nothing about this agenda is coercive. A, you know, a certain kind of conservative will always say, we urbanists, we're trying to force everyone into towers, we're trying to force everyone to do this or that. I have no interest in that at all. What we would like to do is to help people take responsibility for their choices. And, I, and, and if I sound like a, a Republican there, I'm sorry, that should not be a conservative <laughs> idea. It is, in fact, just the basis of free, free democracy, a free democracy of adults. So what's abundant access? Well, what if our task were just to grow these blobs for the greatest number of people? How would we do that? Hint, the answer is not just entirely subway, subway, subway. <laughs> First of all, of course, we're not interested in the area we're trying to cover. We're interested in the amount of stuff in that area. So please remember that every time you're doing urban planning, every time you're thinking about urban planning, and you see a map that is geographically accurate, that map has a hidden subversive agenda, which is that it wants you to value all, every hectare the effect of any geographical map is that every hectare looks equally important. But if you want to build a city around people rather than hectares, you have to constantly be seeing density. And you have to have a way of getting a representation of where the people are. Because otherwise, a geographically accurate map <clears throat> will, will make every hectare look equally important, and that conveys a bias against the interests of people who live at the higher densities. So as I mentioned in my book in the 2000 congressional election, by the way, Canadian, Canadian, Canada is so big and so urbanized that I don't think the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation would ever do this, but CNN does in the US. In the 2010 election, they showed us this map of a nationwide map of all of the congressional districts. Now, obviously, a nationwide map of all of the congressional districts is a map showing all of the rural congressional districts because they are the only ones that are big enough to be seen on a nationwide map. And before the election, about half of them were blue, and after the election, now watch this, sweeps his hand, they all turn in. In other words, there was a major Republican sweep of rural and exurban voters in that election, which made the entire map of the nation turn red because you can't see the little blue urban districts from that scale. Now that is a very blatant example of someone who wants you to confuse area with population, and you always have to be aware of that. So the area of your blog is actually something called mobility, which is a whole lot less interesting than access. The amount of stuff in the blog, the amount of, of opportunity in the blog, the number of different things you can choose from, that's access, and that's what we care about in the city. And so you can start to think about turning these into indices. You know, what percentage of the city is jobs, nightclubs, shops, parks, whatever, can I get to in 15 or 30 minutes? And again, this comes back to something that everyone should be able to grasp. 
because it's really how much of the city in all its richness is available to me. We're not talking about transportation anymore, except that we are. Transportation is how we implement an agenda of freedom in the city. Now I have to make one other point, <laughs> which is that this map in plotting and showing you where you can go doesn't care whether you prefer to ride on rails or tires. It doesn't care whether when riding on rails you would rather have a third rail or a pantograph uh, source of, of electric propulsion. It doesn't even care whether you would prefer to ride underground on the surface. You may have preferences about all of those things, but it assumes that even more important than your preferences about those things, you just want to get where you're going. And you want to have the maximum possible access. And when, any, ever, any, when, in, when anyone ever tells me, but this technology is obviously superior, I say, okay, is that more important to you than having the maximum possible freedom to access the riches of your city? Because any real transit system is made up of lots of different modes, and if you're going to have preferences among the modes, you're simply shrinking your own blocks, which you're welcome to do for yourself, but which is a problem when we actually build our transit systems that way, when we actually shrink these blocks for everyone because we're obsessed with implementing a particular favorite technology rather than just liberating everyone to the greatest possible extent to access their city. Abundant access is made of walking and then of a network of routes and lines that have these six features. These are all very, very quantitative, they're very measurable, they have very little to do with technology except in certain cases. We could go into detail, but for example, speed and reliability, which is something that people often associate with certain technologies over others, has nothing to do with whether you're running on rails or tires, and it certainly has nothing to do with whether you have third rail or pantograph propulsion. It has everything to do with what can get in the way of the vehicle and how often it stops. You can run uh, light rail at a spectacularly high speed and reliability if you design it to be a regional long distance rapid transit system like Seattle's, which stops about every two kilometers. You can also use exactly the same technology to run the King Street streetcar at whatever it is, well, 15 case an hour. It depends on what you want. And the technology choice is not the real choice, is not the interesting or important choice if access is what we're trying to do. But I want to come back to one of these in particular, frequency, which is in many ways I think the hardest for us to talk about. Because frequency is both fundamental to our experience of freedom and yet also invisible. I can't show you a photograph of it. We are bombarded by photographs. Every media article about transit has a photograph, but we can't photograph frequency. It's a temporal thing. So, and yet, the slogan, frequency is freedom. What do I mean by that? I mean that the reason we like our personal vehicle, the reason we like our car, is that it's there ready to go whenever we're ready to go. And transit isn't. Well, frequency is the extent to which transit starts to approximate a vehicle, your own vehicle being ready to go whenever you are. And when you reach the extreme of, some, of, of a, a, a bus line that runs every two minutes, a bus arriving on every single signal cycle, well, your car couldn't improve on that, could it? You know, that's, that is freedom. That is freedom to have it. But, but here's the thing. Many of our decision makers are themselves motorists. And I have the highest respect for people who want very badly for transit to succeed, but who for their own reasons are themselves motorists. I'm not judging them. But the fact is that if you're habitually a motorist, you don't have a daily experience of frequency. The closest thing you have is the cycling of the traffic signals. You don't have that experience of you are stuck until service proceeds. And that is, I think, the biggest barrier for people to confront. So it's invisible, and when I'm trying to explain it to a motorist, I don't have a good analogy. I find myself saying things like, imagine there's a gate at the end of your driveway that only opens once an hour. And that is the transit rider's experience. And when this person wraps his head around it, thinks, whoa, so maybe it's not all about making the buses run faster. No, maybe I need to get this gate open. Okay, that's a really different approach to this. Successful transit systems these days, um, and I take some credit in having driven this process, I, I began advocating for it about 10 years ago, are drawing striking new maps in which the frequent network jumps right out at you. This is the network map for Washington, D.C., and from the very back of the room, you can see where the frequent network is. It is all of the red lines. 
and it connects with the subway system, which is all of the black lines. And then there are a bunch of other blue lines on that map that you can barely see, and that's the point. You have to look closely to see them because they're specialized and much less important and attract and, and are relevant to much smaller numbers of people. So this mapping style is about making the network simple for the 80% of the people who only need that simple network. What it's also doing by advertising that frequent network, it's saying, this, we, are, we know that some people do not wait 30 minutes for buses. Here is the network that's relevant to you. Here is the network that's relevant to people who cannot build their lives around a bus schedule. And until your transit agency has drawn that and shown that to you, I submit to you that you cannot even know what it does. It's in my, my business involves going from city to city. I have to learn transit networks quickly. And over and over and over, I have to tell my staff, draw me, a, go into the schedules and draw me a frequency network at this city because the transit agency's map is incomprehensible and I need to know what the city actually looks, what the system actually looks like. And to me, a map of what the system looks like is a map of routes color-coded by frequency with the frequency jumping right out of me. So I know to start with, where is the truly liberating network? Where is the freedom? Frequent network brands, as a result, are spreading very rapidly. A bunch of different systems are doing things with them. Vancouver, BC, adopt, uh, the regional agent, uh, agency in uh, Vancouver, BC, Metro Vancouver, adopted a goal that said that 50% of all population and jobs will be on the frequent network. That was achieved, of course, partly by extending the frequent network and partly by infilling more jobs coming to the frequent network where it already was. They've already achieved that goal. Lots of different styles now in terms of, of, of advertising this to the public. Um, Montreal, the Réseau des Minutes, um, is the other one nearby. And then you see it. And then when we think about frequency, it's also frequency that unlocks this incredibly magical, powerful thing called the grid. And I want to observe, and perhaps the most striking and disturbing thing I've observed as I've started looking at Toronto, is that you have a grid and you have one of the most powerful possible urban structures for liver, for mobility and for freedom. And yet it feels like you don't quite trust it. Here's what it means to trust the grid. And I'm talking now not just about the little street grid, the, well, the fine grade street grid like where we are now. I'm talking about the big mega grid of arterial space one or two k's apart that defines the whole shape of the city. If you deploy long transit lines that go all the way across the city that run very frequently and that run in a grid pattern, you get this remarkable result. That from absolutely any point A to absolutely any point B, close your eyes and take a stab at the map, it doesn't matter where, absolutely any point A to absolutely any point B, here's how you get there. You walk to one of the major lines, you ride, you get to a connection point, you make a connection, the connection is easy because the service is frequent. You ride to point B, and then you walk to your destination. Think about how much of the Toronto Transit conversation is about who gets what and which neighborhood gets it first. And you start to recognize the power of a style of network design that does not have to have that conversation because it is equally useful to, for absolutely everywhere to go, absolutely everywhere. And the great, intense, and tremendously powerful bus system in Los Angeles works on this principle. Many other cities work on this principle. If you open up my book, I'll also, I also talk you through the example of San Francisco, which does not have a grid pattern of arterials. It has a terribly squiggly pattern of streets. And yet, I'll show you how planners have diligently designed routes that get all the way across the city on the same line of latitude, or all the way across the city on the same line of longitude fighting their way against the various aspects of the street pattern that try to pull them off course and then getting back. That's how powerful the grid is, that a city whose street network doesn't suggest a grid nevertheless insisted on it as the fundamental principle of its network design. Now here you are in Toronto, you have a grid, the street network suggests this great powerful grid, and yet your transit network is presenting you with a very interrupted grid. So here's your subway network, right? Well, the uh, blur is down off the bottom of the page here. Now we've got some light rail lines. Look at Shepherd. Try to get across town on Shepherd. We'll have light rail, and then you'll get off and get on a subway, and then you'll get off and get on a bus if you want to like get on over to the university. 
The way a powerful grid actually works is that the service goes right across the city so that you only have one transfer to make an L-shaped trip to get absolutely anywhere you're going. But the Toronto infrastructure is frustrating that. And some of the styles of network planning that I'm seeing in Toronto are frustrating that. Because now look at what the buses do. You have a grid of high frequency buses, but they all end at Yonge Street when they're moving east and west. And so you again have this dynamic trying to move from east to west across the city. In a grid, you're going to have to transfer once to make your L-shaped connection to get to exactly wherever you're going. But when we force people to transfer again to keep going the same direction, we really undermine how the grid idea, how the grid is ideally supposed to work. It's as though we have this history of bus being about just feeding subways just to go downtown. And that's a really obsolete model of transit in a city where there are so many other destinations that people are trying to get to. So I want to talk a little bit about some alternatives to abundance some other things for which we sacrifice abundance of access. One is the notion that transit can be in some way equitable. Equity, we hear. Uh, I, you will never see me use the word equity without quotation marks around it. And that means I don't know what it means, or rather I know that when different people say it, they mean different and opposite things. So equity belongs to those category of words, the technical term for them is motherhood words, which when you get a group of citizens around tables with flip charts and invite them to wordsmith a vision of their future, they will agree on these words and these words will naturally percolate to the top and you will end up with statements like, our vision is a city of, uh, is a sustainable and prosperous city with equity for all. And um, that says nothing, it does not tell anyone what to do, it doesn't direct the staff about what to do and therefore it has no effect on reality. Um, here's the thing. Here's the rule. The x-axis here is density. Wilderness on the far left, farmland, rural lifestyle, 60s suburbia, inner city, downtown, Tokyo off the right. <laughs> the y-axis is service investment per unit of area. In other words, how much should we spend on you as opposed to you on this hectare as opposed to that hectare? It's the question of the policy of how we spread the goodies around. And in a city with 40-some councillors, each representing wards, you have an ideal structure for having endless fights about that, right? So, you're, so what's, what everyone, I think, would, what, what will make everyone's lives so much easier is to have a policy. How do we do this? Well, there's one view that says, you know, Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones are, are, are both in their 80s now. They're close friends. And Mrs. Smith still lives in 60s suburbia. She lives in the big house where she raised her family. And Mrs. Jones has moved downtown and lives in the inner city. And they get together for lunch and they talk about transit and Mrs. Smith complains about how terrible her bus service is. She has to walk out to this big street and the streets aren't plowed very well and, and you know, the bus doesn't come that often. And Mrs. Jones says, well, oh, I have you know, transit going by every minute or two. I can get to all these places. And they both agree that the city is being terribly unfair to Mrs. Smith, right? And that there's something wrong with the fact that Mrs. Smith doesn't have what Mrs. Jones has. These people are coming at this with a, with a very subjective notion of equity. We're all citizens, we're all taxpayers, we should all have the same thing. Transit can't do that once it starts actually generating significant demand. Subjective equity is a great way to design a bus system for a freestanding town of 10,000 that only seniors and high schoolers will ride anyway. You draw a big one-way loop, everybody has an hourly one-way loop. You're not really trying to compete with the car. It's just a pure lifeline sort of service. But, and then someone points out, actually, if you want Mrs. Smith in her 60s house to have the same service as Mrs. Jones in her tower downtown, what you're actually saying is that you want to spend a hundred more, a hundred times as much of the public purse on Mrs. Smith's needs than on Mrs. Jones's needs. Because Mrs. Smith has chosen to live in a place where serving her is vastly more expensive per person. And so that raises the idea of, okay, maybe we should just be equitable by population. You know, twice as much service here where there are twice as many people. That's the idea of the orange line. But the red line is the actual shape of transit demand in response to density, and it is curved. 
And the fact that it's curved is very important because what it means is that through most of the range of densities in which we work, certainly in a place like Toronto, this is curving upward. As density increases, of demand rises faster than density. I want this to be mathematically obvious to you. This isn't, doesn't need to be an empirical observation. It's mathematically obvious, and here's why. At twice the density, there are just twice as many people around the sun, right? So if everybody in the city had the same propensity to use the transit, to use transit, twice the density would be twice the range. But then, separate from that, people that live at high densities are more likely to have a disincentive to drive. Parking's probably more expensive or more of a hassle. Transit's likely to be closer. So each individual person living at high densities also has a higher propensity to use transit. That's two straight lines multiplied together. They're two independent factors. You multiply them together, and you get a parabola, which is exactly what we observe. That if you actually, and if you actually want to fully meet the needs of your city, you have to deploy service along the parabola. If you deploy service along the orange line, instead of the, but the demand is, is the parabola, then when the red parabola is under the orange line, that's called all those empty buses in the suburbs, right? Lots of service being run where there really isn't much demand. And then the red line, the red parabola goes way up over the orange line, and that's called overcrowding in the inner city. Right? Where you have, if you have not stayed with the red line then what, and, and are running less service, you're going to end up with overcrowding. And sure enough, you have both of those things. And that's a function of the fact that we usually end up agreeing on something closer to the orange line. But the natural demand pattern of transit is the red line, and yes, that is massively unfair. Sorry. That's how transit works. So when somebody says equity, I don't know whether they mean subjective equity. Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones should have the same thing because they're both taxpayers. Or whether they mean equity by population, or whether they mean equity by demand, which is really what abundant access is about providing. But the other interesting thing is that you draw that equity by demand curve and everybody in 60 suburbia screams that you hate them and are discriminating against them. Okay, how do you answer that? Partly by stepping out of the transit box and, represent, and recognizing that there are so many other kinds of public investment that, that are vastly greater per capita in the suburban area. Most obviously, the per capita needs for road space, which are vastly, vastly higher in lower density suburbs and infinitesimal among the massed towers of downtown. So there are so many other kinds of investments that cut the other way that the only reason we have this kind of, of constant anxiety about you're getting more than me is because we're not able to take the bigger picture about the total abundance access picture. And frankly, if you're going to live on a suburban cul-de-sac on a quarter of an acre, the car is a fundamental part of your abundant access, and it always will be, because that's what that area is designed for. And we only confuse ourselves and confuse the whole notion of what transit is when we try to pretend that transit can be equally good for everyone. So there's no such thing as a city-wide or region-wide transit policy unless it starts by observing how different parts of the city are different and therefore have different needs. Otherwise, you end up with an endless, painful conversation of my neighborhood versus yours, my ward versus yours. It's totally unedifying. It does not make us better people. It creates a great deal of anger and frustration, and it doesn't get anything done. Um, why do I have a picture of a pew? Because sometimes I feel it's like this, and I've been through this in a lot of other cities. You know, in Los Angeles, they invented a wonderful, wonderful high-frequency shuttle system for the downtown called the Dash came every five minutes, cost a quarter, everybody used it to get around inside downtown. But downtown was just one council room. So all the other councilors said, okay, when are we getting ours? Well, this was a, this high frequency intensive service is geared to a downtown. It's a cluster of towers with massive numbers of people moving to every block. But no, we had to go create one for every neighborhood. And those all drive around in a little loop around, around the neighborhood and they come about once an hour because you know there's almost nobody there and nobody rides them, and it's very expensive. And why did we have to do that? I wanted someone to say, yes, counselor, I understand that you're not getting one of these. But you know it's kind of like this. We have a couple municipal fishing piers. And they're only in certain council districts. And counselor, your district can't have one because it isn't on the lake. 
<laughs> and municipal fishing piers are wonderful things, but you really have to be on the lake for us to build one for you. That's obviously ridiculous. A councilor of an inland board would not demand a municipal fishing pier, but insisting that there must be subways, subways, subways to every single council board is just exactly as crazy. And it's crazy for exactly the same reason. Because you're demanding that one single solution is right across an incredible diversity of totally different situations with totally different kinds of demand. So I want to come back and, and wrapping up by talking again about this problem of technology love and the way that our emotional reactions to technologies get in the way of our abundance, our freedom. So whenever I'm at some party and someone asks what I do, and I say I'm a public transit planner, without fail, they're ordinary people, I'm not, I'm not experts, but without fail, their next, their next question is, what do you think of, and they name some sort of transit technology, what do you think of monorails? What do you think of bus rapid transit? What do you think of? And it's as if you were asking a carpenter, what's your favorite kind of wood? Or what's your favorite tool, the hammer or the saw? <laughs> and the carpenter says, they're tools. I don't have a favorite. They have different purposes. Why don't you focus on what I'm trying to build here instead of on the tool side? That's the problem. And many, many transit agencies reinforce it. If I get onto a streetcar in Melbourne, Australia, what I'll see on the wall of the streetcar is a map of all of the streetcars. It shows only the streetcars. Uh, you can't really see it. I'm not going to discuss the wisdom of yellow lines on a white background, which is how they chose to draw that. But in any case, you'll see this map. And what does that say? That says that because I've gotten on a streetcar, they assume that I am a streetcar person and that I would only ride streetcars because after all, I'm on a streetcar and therefore I'm a streetcar. This is exactly the opposite of the rhetoric and the way we understand actual freedom. Which is, no, sorry, I'm actually on this streetcar because it goes where I'm going. I don't care really whether it's on rails or tires, I want to go over there because that's what my life and my freedom and my, opportunity, my need for opportunity require. So it's that presumption. I don't care whether you have a percent, a, a, an aesthetic preference for one technology over another. The question is, do, does that aesthetic preference overwhelm, overrule your desire to get where you're going? If so, you're going to have less access. This whole notion that, so the way to think of this is, is the technology a goal or is the technology a tool? So to close, I want to quote one of my favorite Western philosophers. He came out of the Western Zen tradition, Alan Watson who in his book, The Wisdom of Insecurity, mentioned in passing that in Western cultures were prone to eat the wrapper and throw away the food. What he meant by that is that in this culture in particular, we have become so used to being surrounded and, and bombarded with symbols of things that we desire. Symbols of food, symbols of happiness, symbols of prosperity, symbols of sex. They're coming at us all the time. And I, when I think of that Alan Watts quote, I think of standing looking at a display of protein bars, and I notice that the thing that I want is completely concealed by a wrapper. In fact, often the thing that I want is concealed by a photograph of the thing I want, <laughs> rather than just letting me see the thing I want. And what does it mean to say that we eat the wrapper and throw away the food? It's that the wrapper, the, the marketing is so mesmerizing. The excitement that comes from, the, from, from, from that photograph, which is not about showing us what the thing looks like, but rather triggering our desire for it. Um, but that's what we end up saying. So I just want to end by suggesting that all of these fun, sexy transit technologies, whether it's subways or phallic buses or light rail of various kinds or monorails, that's the wrap. This, your freedom and opportunity to access your city, is the food.
Daniel and David have them, you can grab one. Write your question down, they will uh, bring it up to me and I'll kind of shuffle through them and sort through them. I'm noticing there's some people standing in the back. There's actually um, about 10 seats up here in the front if you'd like to come up to the front. Don't be shy for those out in the lobby. You get front row seats for the second half of the performance. It's your lucky day. Hesitate, and was in fact provocative. Um, I, I jotted down some notes, and I think what I'll do is kick off with a few key questions. And our objective here is to really have a bit of a dialogue with respect to some of the ideas that were suggested. And the first, um, the first issue or question that I'd like to raise, an area where I think you were quite provocative, was in suggesting that we in fact make, we make, we all make housing choices, which of course we do. And we choose different kinds of environments where we want to live. And we have become accustomed in the context of the debates that we've been having in the city of Toronto to believe that we all have the right to the same access to a subway. Whether, no matter where I live in the city, I should have access to a subway. Which if we think about it for a minute, we know that's problematic as you say you need density for a subway to in fact be viable. And we've even gone so far as to build a subway um, that doesn't have the density and it's a very expensive subway. And you might recall that in the context of our budget debate four years ago, that there was a question about closing the subway on the weekend, closing the Shepherd subway on the weekend because it runs at such an incredible loss because it's empty on the weekend, which just makes the point that the tool is wrong that we got the tool that we were using in that environment, it, it didn't quite match the, the urban form. But an assumption of that whole argument is that we all have housing choice, that we can all choose to live exactly where we want to live. And I've been thinking about this idea for quite some time, that really our congestion problem is really an affordable housing problem. Because if we could all, Apparently, because we all want subways, if we could all live next to a subway, we would. And we do know that in the past 10 years, we've seen a real shift in our real estate market, and all of the units closest to our subway or car or transit, they tend to sell first and they're more expensive. So the farther away you get from the transit infrastructure, the less expensive the housing. So it, it, it goes to following on that logic, uh, we could say, well, many people in the city want to live near a subway and want to live near great transit, but they can't afford it. They can't afford to live in those dense environments. And then there's a whole raft of people who don't want to live beside a subway, who choose to live in low density environments, and presumably they're not the people arguing for a subway because they've chosen to live in an environment where there isn't one. They could have chosen to live where there is one. Those aren't the people I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who really don't have that housing choice for economic reasons, and that does really get into the equity argument. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that idea, because it seems to me that's a pretty important piece to get right, is recognizing this challenge of people not being able to afford to live in a place that gives them the choice that you're talking about. Exactly. So, first of all, I mean, let's celebrate the fact that transit is so fundamentally appreciated as foundational to prosperity that it has the effect of raising property values. That is actually a good sign. The high cost of something is a signal to the market that you should build more of it. And so one answer to that question is we need to build a subway down Finch West and to some of the other, um, um, I think they're called priority neighborhoods, I might call them neighborhoods of concern, areas where there's a, a high degree of um, low income or people with high risk of isolation. The other solution is to say, you know what? A prosperous city needs to have solutions that work at various different price points. And there has to be a way to meet the transit needs of people at various different price points. And although if you actually had to have had intentionally constructed corridors with the, with the incredible density and walkability and linearity to support a subway, it would be logical to build a subway there. Where lower income people end up living um, out in Mississauga, out in some of the outer suburbs, tends to be places where the, where the pedestrian environment is poor, tends to be places where there are difficulties with access, tend to be places where there are significant signals to us as transit planners that this will not be a strong transit market, 
because there, because there are other problems. Maybe it's just that we have to cross an enormous distance of nothing in order to get to a particular destination. So one of the suggestions that I have, or one of the possibilities to think about, is that we may need, uh, is that Toronto may need, while it's having this long-term conversation about priority rail infrastructure, to have a very urgent conversation about the bus system and about how the bus system could be reworked so that it is much more useful for going anywhere to anywhere, so that it is as fast and reliable as it can be while being on the surface as it is. So that working, you have to work with enough of the existing reality that you don't do something so expensive that you can't do it easily sitting by. So, you know, and, and that's one of, and the crucial thing is to get that basic degree of access. It's not going to be a subway, but it can be something that's as fast and reliable and frequent and connected as, you, as, as it can be given what it is. And you could actually develop it much more quickly. This is the model of the um, Metro Rapid System in Los Angeles, which I encourage you to ride, where effectively, in a very similar political moment, they said, Okay, we've hit the wall on rail construction. We don't have the consensus to move forward with anything much right now. So, and yet we have this fast-growing city and, and a tremendous transit needs. Don't let anyone tell you that Los Angeles is the transit city. Um, and we have this incredibly overcrowded bus system. What is everything we can do to increase people's the utility of the bus system? that two criteria, one, that we can spread it all over the city, it's not just one quarter that we start with, and two, we can get it all done in two years. People now on the city council will be able to cut ribbons on this thing, which is not something that's gonna be true of any gigantic multi-trillion dollar project that's going to take years. And the Metro Rapid is very interesting. What it is, is bright red buses running at high frequency, they are in mixed traffic because you couldn't fight that battle and get it done quickly. So they do sometimes get stuck in the congestion, but they have signal priority, and they form a big grid, and they give you that anywhere to anywhere mobility. And when they get to the biggest street, but when they cross the biggest grand boulevard in Los Angeles, Wilshire Boulevard, which is very analogous to Young Street, they do not all end and force you to transfer to keep going in the same direction. Instead, they run all the way from the hills until they run into a national boundary 30 or 40 k's away. They're very long, they're very fast. They're, well, they're relatively fast given what they're doing, and they're very crowded. And they're liberating. They're about 25% faster than the locals who are in the same port. And again, what they do is give you those fast paths across the grid, but make every single grid connection so that you can go anywhere you want in the city. And I think you may want to think about trying to do something like that. Where you can where you can make sure that we are doing everything where you are really come out of that saying, with buses, we have now done everything we could reasonably do for every corner of the city, where it was at all viable, and particularly for all those priority neighborhoods. So that they have access. It's not necessarily everything they want. We can't build subways everywhere. On the other hand, this is something that you, city councilman, if you win one more election, might get to cut the ribbon on. And that's not true of any of these giant projects that we wait years, if not decades. I try to sort them out a little bit and to, and to cluster them. And I'm going to go for the jugular here, the, the, the biggest one where there are the most questions uh, that come forward um, pertains to the relationship between good transit planning and politics. And I have quite a few cards here about uh, the power of implementation different political bodies, like we have in this situation, we have the CTC, we have Metrolink that's responsible for regional transit. Uh, there is um, uh, the challenge uh, that's, that's raised in one of the questions here of um, people in what's called voter-rich areas of the city wanting certain tools to be used in the context of, of transit and that having an impact on our ability to plan and overall network. I'm wondering if you can take some of these themes that come from these questions around the politics of planning transit and give us some examples of best case scenarios 
from your experience where a municipality or a region has been able to rise above some of the political tensions that undermine being able to create a system of abundance and drive a, 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 a comprehensive network forward. Do you have some examples that you can refer to? Sure. Um, let me go back to LA, just to Los Angeles briefly. Um, not that it by any means the only model, but it's a very interesting one. Uh, in this particular case, just to look at your geography. So some of you are feeling sorry for yourselves because you have to deal with a city of Toronto, and then you also have to deal with Metrolinx, which is bigger, and then you have to deal with the province of Ontario, and that's a bunch of different layers of government and they can get in each other's way. <laughs> Cry me a river, here's how it works in LA. <laughs> There is something called the City of Los Angeles, which is shaped like a drunken, semi-amputated octopus, completely geographically entangled in a bunch of other municipalities. There are a total of about 200 municipalities. In Los Angeles County, which is the level at which the transit agency is designed, the transit agency metro spans all of Los Angeles County, except for about a third of the county where different municipalities have historically run their own transit systems that are tangled up. And the two transit systems are tangled up in each other, they have different colors, they put up different bus signs next to each other, and pretend that each and publish maps in which the other network doesn't exist, even though they're in the same area. And then, um, <coughs> And then above the level of Los Angeles County, we have um, the regional funding authority. Uh, federal funding comes in not directly to Metro, but through a regional agency of five counties called the Southern California Association of Governments. You have to deal with them. And then above that is the state of California and Caltrans, which of course controls all the roads uh, that you have to work with. And then above that is, of course, the higher, the much larger, more intrusive, and more and and. Uh, much more controlling federal bureaucracy with federal transit administration. You know, you got it pretty easy here. It's all pretty simple. Um, and, and, and the metro rapid was achieved in the political and institutional context that I just described. Now, in terms of politics, in the sense of, yes, people wanting things for their districts, and yes, things being distorted in that way, you know what? The more. The more people actually think about the transit product, the more they realize that what they want in their wards isn't really the solution. I'll give you an example. A lady who's very active in um, transit politics out in Scarborough wrote me an uh, email on hearing him and shared with me an email that she'd written to, uh, Dan to Daniel over here. Um, complaining about, you know, why Star why there's any question why Starbucks is in the subway. And her explanation was, we have people in Scarborough need to get to all over the region. They need to get to the airport. They need to get to the to York University. They need to get up to jobs in the York region in places like Bond Center. They need to get to Mississippi. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so why do you want the subway that takes you into Florida? Um, if you're going to all those other places, don't you want a grid? <laughs> don't you want the ability to get across? She's got some valid complaints. Like, it is really frustrating to try to get across town on Shepherd with all those transfers you have to make every time the technology changes. Yes, there are problems with that. But what the, but the actual desire that she's it's complaining about, which is actually a desire for multi-directional travel provided by multiple intersecting lines, which cannot all be subways if you want to live to see them built, <coughs> right? Is actually a very different vision from the one that she has intensively gotten focused on. So here's the thing. I don't get stuck on the notion that, oh, there's politics, therefore there's no hope. I see my role as being to try to construct the rhetoric and the description of the outcomes that will win in the politics and that will make provincialism look petty. And once provincialism looks petty to enough people, people will stop doing it. <laughs> um, it you know, uh, politicians won't be extremely provincial if they look silly doing it. And if it looks like they're in opposition to something like citywide abundant access, if they really want to be against that, they're welcome to. So, 
That's what so I let think. me just interrupt you there, Mayor Jarrett. So do you think that in getting the conversation uh, and shifting our conversation here, that the issue is uh, we sort of haven't been talking about the right thing? Is, I, is that what you're getting at? That, I think you meant that we need to be talking more about the citywide network. That's the, where the conversation has to focus, and citywide abundance. Right. It's been too much about the individual project. And each individual project is a binary debate, yes or no, do we build this or not? And each individual, the problem with these little projects is that, you know, what are the exact benefits of, you know, four cases of light rail over here and just a fragment of the grid? Well, no, the benefit lies in how you complete the grid in a way that helps people get anywhere they're going. And the whole rhetoric around the individual project, it's hard to follow that. It's hard to see that this project over here is actually something for the whole city. So for example, this lady who wrote to me was very concerned about people being able to get from Scarborough to Pearson. And I thought, you know, if we spent less money in Scarborough, you'd be able to afford to extend maybe like the Eglinton line to Pearson. And she's actually saying, you know what? Local transit in the ward near Pearson is, is absolutely fundamental to Scarborough. She's actually acknowledging that. And yet that, of course, blows up the whole notion that, you know, a downtown line is for downtown. You know, whether the line out but out to Pearson is for the people near Pearson. No, it's for the whole. And that's the challenge that we have is this issue of recognizing that there's a shared interest, exactly. that there's a broader shared interest. And we seem in our conversations to get locked into this um, uh, this these positions. We back each other into a corner, implying that not everyone's going to win. Everyone can't win. The way we're doing the system, only a few people are going to win. And in the past, it's been the downtown that's won because they've got the most subways. So now it's someone else's turn to win. Well, okay, you can build more subway extensions leading into the overcrowded young and poor subways, but you won't get a seat coming back in the evening. Um, I mean, downtown's problems are the whole city's problems. The problems around Pearson are the whole city's problems. Scarborough's problems may be the whole city's problems. Because people are trying to get from everywhere to everywhere, and it's not, and, and if you want to get from everywhere to everywhere, you can't just care about transit in your own ward. And you shouldn't be voting for a councilman based on what they promise to do about transit in your own ward, because I bet your commute takes you out of your ward. So let me, so, so let me pick up on that. I have to unfold in a suburban-urban context. Our lives actually unfold all over the city. We cross those boundaries all the time. And we have destination, origin, trips throughout the city that show us that we're all crisscrossing the city and moving across different boundaries all the time. So this notion that we're only suburban or only urban is, is false. We simply don't function in the city like that. You talked a little bit about um, the motorists and the view from the motorist perspective. Uh, one of the challenges I think we also have is that in some parts of the city, most of us use a variety of ways to get around. We already have a variety of choices. So I'm a case in point because I take the subway in the summer I cycle. I also drive when I need to drive. I use whatever choice is the most convenient at any given at any given time. But then there's some areas in the, in the city where there is less choice as a result of less density, less critical mass, which means it hasn't been viable to add more choice. So how do you deal with that tension? The perception that there's less choice in a particular area uh, may be a fact that an area is just underserved relative to what's possible. Uh, it may be that the that the structure of the network is wrong for the for liberating that area. Certainly, if you live a little ways east of Young and you're stuck on some east-west service where every time you want to go west of Young, you have to transfer one just to get west of Young, and then again to get to where you're going. Um, you know that's. There are those cases. There are also cases, though, where people live in fundamentally transit-hostile landscapes or transit-toxic landscapes. Landscapes where um, you can't really walk out to a bus on the major streets, therefore you need a bus that wanders through your subdivision. And a bus that wanders through your subdivision goes like this, because that's what the roads require. And once you go like this, nobody is going to ride this for more than a couple of days going like this. And as a result, you have a predictable Come back to the fact 
that if you live in that landscape, though, the car's really useful to you and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think we do a lot of harm when we stigmatize the local motoring of people who live in car-oriented landscapes, which, where transit can't really be the answer for very many things. And we have to celebrate the fact that those people are going to continue to drive, and that's part of the abundance of their access. They'll probably they'll more likely drive to transit when they want to go downtown, which is great too. And that has to be okay. So we have to be clear that we're going that the city is going to achieve its its vehicle kilometer travel, the trip reduction goals, or anything like that, very unevenly across the city, mostly in certain places where transit is achieved. So I'm going to shift the conversation the feeling congested to evaluate different tools revenue tools for paying for transit. And recently the transit panel uh, that was appointed by the Premier looked at this question of revenue tools and what kind, what are the best ways to, to pay for transit. And this has been quite a robust debate in this, in this region. Uh, and in the middle of this debate, we in fact had the council debate about the Scarborough subway. And interestingly, very quickly, a tremendous amount of money, $3 billion, was in fact found to pay for the Scarborough subway, which made it very clear, I sort of thought it made it clear that we don't actually have a funding problem. It's about having clarity about what we want to spend money on, because when the council had clarity about what it wanted to spend money on, it found the money, found the money to spend it. The, there's a few questions here that relate to this question about what is the best way to pay for transit, how, what is the best way to do this, um, but that has to be linked from my perspective to the question, and it's also here as well, around how you create a cost-benefit analysis that's going to be effective. And Metrolink is in fact required to create a cost-benefit analysis uh, for different options that was not created for the Scarborough subway in part because it came forward when it was already an approved project. But it does raise this question of how we increase our own literacy in terms of understanding when a project will con contribute to building up the overall network and abundant access, and when it will in fact uh, be a really expensive investment that might not do that. And I think we, uh, we need some tools in order to figure that piece out and to embrace that in our conversations about transit planning. I think what's been missing is that to a great extent the conversation has been about a pile of projects rather than about a network. And that what was needed all the way through in the cost-benefit process was to, first of all, make the case for a complete network. Draw the complete network. What's going to ultimately be the solution for every single street, not just the big streets where you know you have some sort of project? And that would be the scale at which you could realize that you need to complete the grid, that you need to stop building things that are just little fragments that force people to transfer to people in the same direction. And then, too, each piece would be understood as vastly multiplied in its value by the way it, for example, completes the grid or opens up new connections. Um, and, I, and so that's, I think, fundamental to the cost benefit. Um, and, 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 and ultimately, what I, what I think would be best would be be able to run more of the cost benefit on the entire network and be able to say, and you have to do a whole lot of other things, like you have to first push back on the moderators when they want to put huge penalties on transferring based on how unpleasant transferring is now. We know that transferring is founded on transferring, and let's assume we've made transferring. <coughs> but um, fundamentally, to have that vision of the entire network, and then be working backwards from there in terms of each of these things is a piece towards that network, and, and, it, is, and it is really not just something that, you know, this piece project doesn't have its own benefit. It is simply, you know, 7% of the total network, which has the total benefit. And that would have captured much more effectively, I think, the total interdependence of these projects, which is something that the standard, standardized way of handling one project at a time, each with its own limit line, each with its own assumptions, tends to lose track of. And you wouldn't have built the, the Shepherd East subway as such a tiny little fragment if you'd been thinking this way. You know, you would either have saved up to know that you were going to do, do an entire Shepherd subway, you know, or not. And, and, and 
that, and, and so I think that kind of process is what's needed, and the cost benefit has to attach to the entire network. So this is interesting because uh, this almost links back to that question around the, the politics of planning transit infrastructure, because the catch-22 is that we need we need a big plan. We can't do the little pieces. We need a big plan, a big vision that looks at the whole network, and yet we get trapped in cycles of funding and decision making that are actually relatively short. And that creates a really significant problem. You talk about residential density. We know that in the city of Toronto, our employment land, for each square foot of employment land, we have four times the ridership of a, um, of a quarter of, of, of its residential. So it's four times the ridership residential to employment land. So we know employment land and providing access to employment land is a really important part of our transit system. So that's an important additional layer in terms of interdependency. And I'm wondering if you can also, in answering that question, talk a little bit about the relationship between other modes of movement, mm -hmm. uh, cycling facilities, and the relationship between transit and cycling facilities, the relationship between cycling and walking. and. Uh, and there is a question here about elevated bike queues. Uh, in case you want to get into that. So Norman Foster. Norman Foster in London. Yes, beware the great architects. <laughs> I didn't set him up for that. They tend, to, uh, they tend to think that one thing is the answer and one thing is never the answer. The thing is the answer is always the combination of things and the thing you have to visualize as the network. Um, every day it seems like there's some new proposal for some wonderful thing that you could only ever build one of. And, um, and that's something we should always be aware of, just as I think you've already learned from the Scarborough RT that you never build version 1.0 of anything, <laughs> and you never offer to be anyone's beta test site. Right? <laughs> and this is, frankly, I'm, and, and vendors are frustrated a little, uh, about this, and I feel their pain, but they need to go do demonstration tracks or whatever um, before you expect the city to buy one of these things. Um, so the question was about um, intermodalism and how different modes work together. In the Netherlands, uh, where um, Jennifer's grandmother is cycling, has, was cycling around in her 80s, cycling infrastructure is so rich and so safe that it substantially reduces the need for infrequent low ridership bus routes to drive around in low density. And that's good because that's an incredibly inefficient thing for transit to do. It's one of those, the most inefficient things that transit is asked to do. That's interesting because we in America, in North America, in the US and Canada, tend to have this model that cycling starts in the city with all the young urban, urban lines, right? Well, no, several cities, Canberra, Australia, where I've worked a great deal, have a fundamental model of cycling that is profoundly suburban and very focused on the low density suburban area where they know transit can't liberate you because you're just too spread out, the streets are too difficult, we can only afford to run once an hour and you're not gonna find that liberating. But you do see urban design that's about making the cycle network really great. You know, when Canberra in Australia was building vast, vast expanses of the most impenetrable loop and loop and cul-de-sac style of suburb, suburb um, you know, a, a street pattern that is almost perfectly toxic for transit. <laughs> they were also making sure that every single cul-de-sac, you go, went into some residential cul-de-sac, house, 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 path. The little path between two houses goes up to the next cul-de-sac. And those paths add up to a complete bicycle and pedestrian grid across what looks to a motorist like he's squinting his lap and suffered it. And so they solved the problem of, they finally solved the, the problem built into so much suburbia, which is in the course of making it a lap and for motorists, we've also made it impossible for pedestrians to sign it. And so I think it's, I think that there's a particular role. We need to look at the other modes, not just in the places where transit does well, where transit can be in London, we need to focus on what bike cycling can do in suburbia, what cycling can do in the places where transit cannot be in London. And that's part of it, together with the fact that there will always just be a lot more driving in those places. Um, and of course, you go to the Netherlands, you see this spectacular bicycle infrastructure, you see 
the great multi-story car park, the multi-story bike parks, the multi-story bicycle parking structures at every station. And you understand too, and you look around too, and you see people of all ages, the duck will tell you that the design cyclist for the Netherlands, the, the person for whom they are designing, is a 65-year-old woman with two bags of groceries. So it's completely welcoming and walk out all across the spectrum. The thing that from, we from the US and Canada probably have the most trouble digesting is young families out without helmets. The Dutch don't generally wear helmets when they're cycling. And that's because they're mostly cycling about 10 to 15 k's an hour or a little faster than that. It's not fast, but it's very, very functional and interesting. So, uh, and it, and it's, and so this is the challenge. When we think about how other modes work with transit, what transit needs you to do is think especially about how other modes can help with the things that transit can't do about. And that's really getting back into the swivel, you know, and where, where buses are just a very, very awkward feature. So the two need to work yeah. hand in hand. They can serve different purposes. I think the uh, one of the reasons why the Dutch don't wear helmets is also because you need a helmet when you're cycling with cars. But you don't need a helmet when you're not cycling with cars if you're cycling in a separate pathway. And I recall years ago, I did a trip um, from, uh, a cycling trip from Amsterdam to Paris. And we, my husband and I got off the airplane in Schiphol and we saw the sign and it said, uh, we were going down to Harlem, which is where my mother was born. And the sign said, Harlem, by car, 12, by bike, seven. It's a completely different route. The cycling route didn't follow the vehicular route the cycling route was actually a shorter route, and we took off through a bunch of fields and went straight to Harlem through these fields. So if you separate those uses, which aren't really very compatible, in my opinion, you provide separate spaces for them and around fares, because we, in fact, fund the operating costs of our transit system significantly from fares. And this is a point of contention. We have significant issues with underfunding on an operational level. And I wonder if you can just touch on that because it is a very sensitive point uh, in, in this city. Oh, there's are one thing that I don't have, think there is a clean answer to. Because this is going to be whatever you negotiate. Because, um, for example, yes, you could astronomically increase your transit ridership <coughs> and decrease your VKT and hit all sorts of greenhouse gas targets by turning down the fares. Um, however, you don't have the capacity on the system to do that. And every time a transit agency has studied, <coughs> this comes up all the time in San Francisco, for example, very progressive, very transit-oriented city. Every time they study, what would happen if we just turned off fares? I mean, wouldn't that get everybody on transit? And the answer is, yes, it would. And how are you going to buy the 800 buses that you would need over? <laughs> to be able to deal with all those people. This is always the problem. Um, I don't think that there's an ideal answer to what percentage of operating costs should be paid by fares, except that I do think we need to start thinking in terms of what percentage of operating uh, of costs are paid by people who use various other modes, and the way that the costs of those modes are externalized. Um, I generally think that the reason we run public transit is to liberate the city and to enable the prosperity of the dense parts of the city. And uh, the idea that that benefit falls primarily or exclusively on people who use transit, as opposed to on everybody who has any investment in any aspect of those parts of the city is kind of weird to me. Um, so I think there are many different philosophies that you can bring to it. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a very interesting question, and it's one that I'm not going to claim as a single answer. Or are much smaller geographically than Toronto. We, are what we call the city, is in fact an amalgamated seven municipalities. Um, and this question is about the size and the implication of the size and the scale, and whether that has an impact on how we should be planning for transit. And that's linked to a question here about whether we should be planning for the density that exists in the city today, or whether we should be planning for future demand. Yes, obviously, both, you have to. But with future demand, you also have the opportunity to shape that demand with the transit system and even with long-term transit plans. Um, 
there, you know, there are a whole lot of examples around Toronto of things you must never build again on the land use side. <laughs> the great gigantic towers that are on cul-de-sacs next to the freeway where a bus could never get anywhere close to them. The giant awkward super block configuration where you can't really walk out of them. I noticed, I, I look for these things on Google Earth that people have archived <laughs> on them, but sometimes I will humiliate that particular development in some book of it. <laughs> um, so there are all these, I mean, I mean, there is a crucial problem with the architecture and development industry not completely understanding what transit-oriented development looks like. And I, the thing I am always inserting into, and the thing that's usually missing in the way my friends in the urban design field talk about this, is this principle. Transit, it is not transit-oriented development unless it is oriented toward transit that can and so it's very easy for a developer to say, well, the hustle just deviate and come around here and go around to the back of my building here and we'll go all the way back there. Well, yeah, that's nice for you to say, but nobody else is going to ride that. And you've just, I mean, you've just wrecked the through ridership of that bus by imagining you do that. And TTC will probably be smart enough to refuse to do that. And so there's a lot, there, there's a lot of discontinuity there. I'm sure none of those mistakes will be made today in Toronto, but you know, it's a thing to keep in mind out of the rest. Um, when I talk about planning for ridership, yes, you have to be talking about the existing demand and you have to be talking about the future demand. This is why when I'm working with operational planners from inside a transit agency, one of the things I hear all the time from those folks is they seem to be very certain that their ridership uh, data is a clear indication of where people want to go. That, you know, and I have to say no, actually your ridership data is a clear indication of where you are willing to carry people. And it obviously reflects the services that you're providing. Um, so we have to be um, we we have to be planning. So the worst thing any transit agency can do is plan entirely for its existing customers. It's a kind of uh, if you if you focus entirely on your existing riders, you are gradually creating a little silo around you and them. And you are becoming less and less interested in why nobody else is. And it's very easy to do because your existing writers appreciate you more and because they contact you a lot more and it's tended to have a great conversation with you. But very frequently, you have selected your existing writers because they happen to find the service convenient, not because you are providing a service that is actually still relevant to the entire city or to the patterns of demand that you Well, you know, it's interesting the comments that you made about those tower communities because there is a direct link between the tower communities and transit, in part because those communities, when they were built, were in fact envisioned to be avant-garde, middle-class communities, and you would drive to them and drive away. And very quickly, precisely because of the lack of transit access, because they were completely disconnected from any kind of amenity within walking distance, within less than a generation, within really 10 to 15 years, they in fact became undesirable places to live, precisely because of that lack of connectivity. Can I make a point on that? Sure. This really goes to something crucial about affordability. If you spend a whole lot of money to get to neighborhoods of concern, the lower income neighborhoods, spending a lot of money on expensive infrastructure causes real estate values to rise, and those people will no longer be there when your infrastructure gets there because they will no longer be able to afford to. They will have been moved on to the next less accessible place where they can still afford to live. That's why this, one of the main reasons why the solution is not just a big, expensive infrastructure, and why there's an urgent need to envision the highest quality thing that you can get all over the city, so that it won't drive up land use prices wherever it is, because it is so abundant that there's room for affordability along. Got to always be aware of that. When you build expensive infrastructure, we're driving up real estate prices. And if you do build expensive infrastructure to get the low income people, this happens all the time. This happens all the time. I'm glad you mentioned that because that was a, that idea was a bit of an epiphany for me about a year ago um, when I, I was looking at the big move and looking at some of the moves that we were making in the city and making that connection between the way uh, poverty and lower income communities continue to be bumped out farther and farther to the periphery. And that bringing in that infrastructure just means they get bumped farther out. It doesn't increase equity, which is why this idea that you're speaking about is so compelling to me of looking at the entire network 
and thinking about how you create through relatively big and immediate moves like the bus rapid transit, increasing frequency on the existing system, how that has an immediate impact on serving those communities that need it most, mm -hmm. as opposed to a large capital project. And it's a big topic of conversation here, and in fact, we're guilty of having those maps. If you look at the map, and the map actually doesn't tell you anything because it doesn't tell you how frequently the service runs. Um, it just tells you that there's a lot of different kinds of service in, in the city. And by popping out the frequency, we in fact could transform the implication of the existing infrastructure that we have. And there's a question here about um, why do we get trapped in that conversation of talking about speed and capacity instead of talking about frequency? And in fact, we, we, in, we are adding new streetcars that increase capacity and reduce frequency. There are some technical reasons for sometimes doing that if you're talking about reducing okay. frequency from every three minutes to every four minutes. If you're talking about reducing frequency from every 10 minutes to every 30 minutes, then no, that is, a, that is definitely a bad thing to do because you will not still have all of those riders once you have consolidated them, them on a vehicle that only comes every 30 minutes. Um, you know, they won't all be there, they won't wait that long. So um, I think that, but the other answer I think, why do we talk so much more about speed than about waiting time, frequency? The only explanation I can come up with is A, is that so many of our decision makers are themselves motorists, or let me be clear, they're users of personal vehicles, which can include cyclists. They don't have the experience of waiting to start their trip or waiting to make a connection. They don't have that experience of you're stuck until we get there. And that's just the huge difference. And so frequency is, again, frequency is the measure of how bad that difference is, right? And once frequency gets really good, then yes, it's as, it's, it's as if you had your own vehicle because you could go out there any time you can. And that's, and that's why I use the slogan, frequency is freedom. Because that's, frequency measures the thing we hate most about transit, which is waiting. It also, by the way, measures the difficulty of connecting which, it, which, is then, which then determines whether you have a pile of lines like products on the shelf or an actual network that things work together. But there's no analogy to it for the motorist, and, I, and, and what, I, what I say in my book with the greatest possible love for all of my motorist friends is just be aware that transit is not like cars and roads. It's fundamentally different, and this is one of the big differences. Well, and this is a big difference, and it's, I think it's a really important insertion into our conversation. This idea that, well, if you wait for 30 minutes, who cares if the train goes super fast? If it goes a little bit slower, but you can get it every, you can get it more frequently, in fact, your journey is going to be shorter. That's right, that's right. And I think that's a very important a winter city and the kinds of tools that we use in a winter city. Um, one of the reasons that sub subways are often advocated as being superior over LRT is because of weather. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit. Um, I have worked all over the world in an extraordinary range of different climates. And except possibly for San Diego, which is the only city in the world that truly has no weather whatsoever. <laughs> um, someone in every city has always said, but the weather. In Singapore, they say, but you know, it's, it's 28 degrees and, and humid all the time. Who will ever use transit in that? Yeah. Um, in, in, in Southern Australia, in Melbourne, they'll say, you know, but it's 35 degrees sometimes. Who would ever use transit in that? I mean, oh, it, remember, in Australia, the word freezing means below 20 Celsius. <laughs> but sometimes it's freezing. Who will go out there when it's freezing? We are actually incredibly resilient creatures when it comes to weather. Remember, one of the great stories of the new Canadians is that people in vast numbers moved from Bangalore to Edmond. <laughs> we are obviously incredibly resilient creatures, and we actually have a lot of very good ways of dealing with the range of climates, 
And after all, as everyone assures me, it is actually not funny below in this city all that often. So the other thing is that it is not very sensible to make enormous investments that pay off only for three or four days of the year. We work with weather in every city. Every city has a few days of extreme weather where the city doesn't function normally, and that's a normal part of being a city. But from your perspective, are there certain technologies that um, work better in certain climates? Is well, sure. Should that, should that connection be made? That Should that be part of the cost benefit analysis? Um, yes, it is certainly more comfortable to be protected from weather and severe conditions, and that's why the heated bus shelter was in there. That's why the passive shading bus shelter was invented for Phoenix. You know, there are lots of, of solutions that scale appropriately to the size of the and nature of the problem. But if you say that weather is a reason that we have to build a few Ks of subway instead of 20, 30, 40 Ks of something we can have a lot more of, is weather really that important? Are there really that many bad days that that is actually a compelling argument? Well, I think that's a very important question. We all, most people exaggerate the weather <laughs> in, any, in any context. <laughs> Um, in part because I didn't want to put Jared on the spot. But I want to assure everyone that all of these questions I'm going to be forwarding to Jared so that he can take a look at them. And Jared was here today working with transportation planning staff, and this morning he facilitated a workshop with staff from the TTC that, of course, operates our transit system with Metrolinx, as well as with city planning. In city planning, we are responsible for transportation planning, which includes transit. So we are working across disciplinary boundaries, and this morning we had a very rich and fruitful, and I would probably say challenging workshop with Jared, where we are challenged to reframe the way we think about how we plan for transit in this city. I have asked Jared to uh, pull together a bit of a synopsis or a report following his time here in Toronto to highlight for, him, for us some of his key observations based on his experiences in other parts of the world that we can now integrate into uh, our thinking here in this context. The objective today was food for thought, and I feel that way. You've raised lots of questions. You've also answered some for me. I hope that others feel that as well. We'd like you to feel free to continue the conversation. If you have comments that you would like to send to the city planning department, you can absolutely do that. We also have a handle, a Twitter handle, which is at CongestedTO, if you'd like to send out comments that will get to us directly. There's also been a hashtag for this event. I forgot to mention it at the beginning, but people who tweet seem to have found it anyway. So uh, there's been lots of, uh, lots of tweeting activity, and I'll be retweeting some of the tweets from this evening as well. And I just want to thank everyone here who is in the room today for being a part of this conversation. And we do have um, a few special guests. I didn't get a chance to acknowledge them at the beginning, but I can see Councillor Lee in the back of the room. And uh, I believe there are some other city councillors here today. We have Councillor Parker in the room as well, and I see sitting beside him, John Torrey. And Mark uh, Mahoney from the Financial District BIA is right behind him. And in the front row here, I would be amiss if I didn't point out the former chief planner of the city of Toronto, uh, Paul Bedford, as well as another former chief. Um, we should all get together for a drink later. <laughs> Bob Miller. Uh, thank you to many leaders uh, who are in the room here today, um, some of whom I'm, I'm glancing around to see if I can recognize Steve. everyone but my guys. <laughs> Steve Monroe is here as well. It's great to have you here, Steve. Uh, thank you all for being here. My hope is that this conversation will continue. And in closing, thanks to the planning team at uh, David Cooper and Daniel Fusca, as well as Dave Hunter and Tim Laspa, who are leading the Field Congested Project. It's involved a lot of complexities and twists and turns along the way, and I fully expect that there will be more twists and turns. Over the course of 2014, 
We're going to be continuing to hold conversations both in the community and with city councilors. And over the course of the past several months, we've been holding ward-based conversations with community leaders and councilors in each of the wards in the city. We are looking at creating that priority network, and that's what we're going to be focusing on the next several of months, looking at the Metrolinks plan, the priority projects identified by the City of Toronto, as well as the bus and streetcar priority, looking at refinements that we can make in order to create a network that provides as much access as possible. In this process, uh, you'll be hearing from us over the course of 2014, as I mentioned, but we will be making some hard recommendations to City Council in January of 2015. So stay posted. And if you want a detailed summary of what it is that we've done so far in this process, you can Google Feeling Congested City of Toronto and our website will come up and you'll see the staff report. And it's about a 15 page report that details everything that we've done today in this process. I didn't want to get things bogged down and going through that detail today, but you can find it if you're interested in seeing it. In closing, one last thank you to Jarrett Walker. Uh, tonight has been uh, really interesting and fun, and we appreciate you coming here. Thank you very much.